I'm so glad he's a prayer answering God. And it doesn't matter how big the mountain is or how small the mountain might be or how deep the valley might be. God is still God. He's still on the throne, and we don't have to worry when we just cast our cares on him. So hopefully in that prayer time, you cast your cares on him. Uh, let me put a plug in for the end of the service prayer time. You know, um, God, I may be done preaching, but God's still not done moving. So if you have a need at the end of the, prayer, or end of the service, uh, come up for prayer. We'd love to agree with you in prayer. God's still doing miracles, amen? So anyway, we're so glad that you're here today. Uh, I want to begin by asking you all a question. Have you ever had a dream that was so real that when you woke up, you were still carrying the feelings from that dream? You ever had a dream that was so real? I think we probably all have. I remember when Cheryl and I were trying to have a baby. Um, Cheryl had some complications with getting pregnant. And during that uh, time, her sister Charlie got pregnant. My daughter Danielle got pregnant. Uh, some of her friends got pregnant. But for about a year and a half, we couldn't. And every single time Cheryl got ready to give up on even the thought of having a baby, three different times she had a dream about a blonde-haired, blue-eyed little boy. And I remember her waking up from those dreams, and I remember her saying, it was so real. It was so real that I feel this love in my heart for that little boy that I saw in my dream. Uh, once she woke up crying, uh, because the dream was over and it was so real, she said, I didn't want it to end. Well, this happened three times. Every single time she was ready to quit trying, she had a dream about this little boy. The funny thing is, once she got pregnant, she didn't even know it. Uh, matter of fact, she was almost three and a half months pregnant and went to the doctor for a routine checkup, and the nurse called her one day and said, Mrs. Piercy, your test came back positive. And I remember Cheryl saying, for what? She thought the nurse was about to tell her some terrible medical diagnosis or something. Then the nurse said, you're pregnant. And guess what? After Austin was born, he was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed little boy. That's a picture of him right there. <laughs> yeah, everybody, oh, yeah. He was so cute. But what I'm saying today is I know that God can speak to us in our dreams. He has us. I'm sure he has many of you. Maybe it's because when we sleep, we can give him our full attention. Maybe when we're asleep, we kind of slow down, we kind of relax, we shut out our cell phones and all the busyness and distractions of the day, but where we give him our complete attention. On the other hand, we also know there are times when we have some crazy dreams, crazy dreams like flying, or maybe getting lost in Walmart, or how about missing that final exam in school and you can't graduate now. Let me just say, those dreams are probably not God-related. It's probably just that pizza you ate late last night before you went to bed. But think about this. Have you ever had a dream that was so real that you just knew that you knew it must have meant something? It meant something. Maybe it impacted you so strongly that you just knew it meant something or it was a sign for something. You didn't know what it was and you didn't know what it meant. Well, we're still in our sermon series on the book of Acts. We've been going through it for several months now, actually. It's often called the Acts or the Actions of the Apostles. I think we could say it's the actions of the uh, new church, the uh, early church, uh, new believers. But I want you to think of this. When we look at what happens to our Bible heroes, our Bible heroes, I think we ought to look at uh, those things as if they could be happening to us. Because when you think about them, every story, and I can stress every story in the Bible, relates to you and me on some level. Somehow it relates to us because God designed his word that way to relate to his people. Last week, if you were here, we saw where God closed the door twice. He put a roadblock in front of Paul and Silas to keep them from spreading the gospel to Asia. That seems kind of crazy for God to close a door like that. But even though God closed those doors, he opened another door so they could get to a, a city called Troas. And you might remember in that city of Troas, that's where Luke was. And remember, Luke's the one that wrote this book of Acts. And Luke joins them on this missionary journey there. Um, God basically, uh, the church, church for the most part up to that point had been contained in the Middle East. It hadn't spread out to Europe yet, which was really the center of civilization at that time. But God closed those two opportunities for them to go uh, minister the gospel to a few cities. But remember what I said God said to, uh, to uh, uh, Paul? He said, Paul, you're thinking too small. 
How many times do we think too small? Probably every day. He says, Paul, you're thinking way too small. I'm going to lead you to take the gospel into the whole continent of Europe, which we found out last week was a really good thing for us because it was from the Europeans. They brought the gospel to North America, so we're still benefiting from that today. So God had a plan to get his word here. He had a plan, and he goes about it by giving Paul a dream. So God works in major ways, sometimes in small ways, but in major ways sometimes to uh, further his purpose. Look at uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 9. It says, And a vision, or a dream, appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul wakes up the next day, and he says to the guys with him, Guys, I think God wants us to go to Macedonia. And the scripture says they immediately went there. Look at verse 10. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we, remember uh, Luke's writing this, he's joined the missionary group, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. We mentioned this last week. Paul heads to Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece, and ends up in a place called Philippi. And when Paul gets to Philippi, Uh, If Paul is like most of us, if we would have seen that vision he had of the man from Macedonia, I bet when he gets there, he's looking for that man everywhere, everywhere he looks. He's looking for that man in his dream that he saw in his dream. He's checking up and down the streets, the alleyways, saying, hey, that could be him over there. That's not him. That could be him. That's not him either. Look what Luke writes in verse 12. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out to the of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and we spoke to the women who met there. Now, Paul had a habit, if you remember. Every time he would go into a new city, do you remember where he would go first? To a synagogue. He would go to a Jewish synagogue, and he would preach the gospel of Christ. Well, on this particular Sabbath day, he didn't go into a synagogue. He went to the riverside, it said in that scripture, where a prayer meeting was taking place with a a group of women, Why didn't he go to a synagogue? Well, according to Jewish law, to establish a synagogue, a meeting place for them to read the Old Testament, for them to have fellowship and prayer, you had to have at least 10 Jewish men. On the other hand, if you didn't have at least 10 Jewish men, you couldn't build a synagogue. You couldn't have a synagogue. And remember, Paul is still looking for this man from Macedonia that he had in his, saw in his dream. And I wonder if he's starting to doubt the dream. Because not only has he not found that man from Macedonia, there's not even 10 Jewish men in Philippi to form a synagogue. You know, I'm sure Paul was a little discouraged by that, but I love how Paul doesn't let things get him down. He doesn't quit. He doesn't throw up his hands and walk away. He goes outside the city gates to the river where he'd heard of some Jewish women that were having a prayer meeting in a makeshift chapel. And they were worshiping the God of Abraham. You know what Paul does? He begins to preach to them right there. Uh, uh, That's where Paul meets up with a woman named Lydia. Look at verse verse 14. One of those listening, I want to stress, notice she's listening. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira, Thyatira named Lydia. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to hear the things spoken by Paul. Lydia is believed to be a very wealthy businesswoman because it says she specialized in selling purple. And the dyes to make purple back then were so expensive. And the only people that wore purple were the rich and famous or royalty. So you might say Lydia was the Vera Wang of Philippi. I mean, when you think about it. And from this, cold, from this uh, scripture, we see that Lydia was a woman who prayed. She prayed. She was in fellowship with other worshipers of God. She read the Old Testament, and it appears she was obeying the law of the Sabbath. But Luke lets us know right away she had not yet become a Christian. She had a heart that was seeking truth, and she was probably doing a lot. She was doing a lot of religious activities, but she's not a Christ follower yet. Then it says, as Lydia worshipped in verse 14, it says, The Lord opened her heart to hear the things spoken by Paul. I want you to hear that. The Lord opened her heart to hear the things spoken by Paul. So God was the one that was stirring her heart, right? God was the one that opened her heart. But you know how he did it? And when he did it, he did so as she listened to the word of God. And even though she was doing all the right things, 
she was still far from God. What's that tell us? You and I can be doing all the right things and still be far from God. We can do all the Christian things. We can worship. We can have prayer. We can have spiritual conversations with one another. We can do all these Christian activities, but really sometimes not be truly saved. We talk about this a lot. When it comes down to it, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. It's not about head knowledge. It's about heart knowledge. It's not about head knowledge. It's about the heart. So how was Lydia saved? I'll give you three things. And the recipe is the same for you and I today in the world today. She heard the gospel. She believed. And then she responded. She heard the gospel. She believed. And then she responded. Look at Romans 10, 17. Paul says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or by the word of God. This is why we need to proclaim the gospel every single chance we get so that those that are spiritually dead can become spiritually alive. You know, someone is waiting out there today. Someone needs to hear not what the world has to offer, but who we have to offer. Amen? We need to tell them about Jesus. Our responsibility is to share the Word of God whenever we have the opportunity. That's our job. God's job is to open the hearts. That's not our job. That's God's job. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7, Paul says this. I planted, Paul says, he's talking about planting spiritual seeds. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth, or God gave the increase. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He's the only one that really matters, amen? The one that gives the increase. So God purposely puts people across our path that are spiritually searching every day because you and I have a job to do. Our job is to tell them about Jesus. And we make it a whole lot harder than it has to be. It says, uh, after Lydia was saved, um, as a result of her public testimony of baptism, her entire family believed. After they saw what happened to Lydia, her entire family believed. And not only that, then they were baptized. Look what it says in verse 15. And when she heard her household were... When she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Lydia was so grateful. She was so thankful that she extended her hospitality by inviting Paul and Silas into her home and their whole group. But I think it's so amazing that the first European convert to Christianity through Paul's ministry was a woman. Not a man, a woman. Now, I'm sure there might have been, and there probably were men of Lydia's household who got baptized, but think about it. It was her. It was a woman who opened the door. She opened the door for them. And, as she, and she was instrumental in starting the first church in Philippi. Matter of fact, it started out of her own home. Think about it. The Lord opened her heart, and she became a Christian. She opened her home, and it became a church. Let me give you a few things about, I think, an amazing woman named Lydia. The first one is, religion without Jesus leaves you unsaved. If you're taking notes, write that down. Religion without Jesus leaves you unsaved. You can have all the religion in the world and still not be saved. Do you realize that? We can do all the spiritual things we can think of. We can even be known by others as being uh, very religious, just like Lydia probably was but she was still far from God. You know, I think her heart was probably in the right place, yet she still hadn't heard about the only name by which we can be saved, the name of Jesus. She hadn't heard about it yet. So put that in our modern day time, spending time at church, supporting ministry, the ministry, attending Bible studies and doing all these church things, all these good things. They're good, but they can't purchase your salvation. Do you realize that? And I'll say this today. God is a whole lot more interested in a relationship with you than he, than he is in you jumping through a lot of religious hoops. He's not so interested in that. Religion without Jesus leaves you unsaved. Point number two, riches without Jesus leaves you unsatisfied. You know, I see a whole world of people that are unsatisfied today, amen? Think about Lydia. Uh, she had all these temporary riches and possessions, yet she wasn't satisfied. Lydia had the world at her disposal, but she didn't have Jesus, and that left her unsatisfied. 
She was still seeking after God because there was something missing in her life. Do you know every person in this world was created and designed by God himself, the creator. And within every one of us, within every soul, is an emptiness that God deliberately put there. There's an emptiness that can only be filled by his son. There is an emptiness that can only be filled by Jesus Christ. You know, we often think of certain possessions, people, substances, and we think those things will satisfy us. That's a lie of the enemy. Only Jesus, when we really come to know him, can do that. Fernando Ortega, he wrote a song years ago, and I love this song. Uh, We sing it once in a while. It says, just give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. That's really all we need. You know, you can have everything you think you need in this life more than you can even imagine, but I promise you, you're never going to be satisfied until you're satisfied in Jesus. Amen? You're never going to be satisfied. Then Paul casts out a demon out of a young girl in verse 16. It says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Scholars believe this girl was probably in her mid-teens. She has a demon, and she's a slave. Look at verse 17. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. Let me stop there. It sounds like she's on the right track. Sounds like great things she's saying. But listen, God doesn't need the devil doing our job. Think about it. God does not need the devil doing our job. It's our job to tell the truth. It's our job to share the gospel, not the devil's. The work of Satan is always, always a reaction to the work of God. You know, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Whenever God works, you're going to see the devil working. It's a reaction. Uh, When God works, the devil's going to be right there to do his thing. And we need to remember the devil usually goes on attack right after we've experienced some uh, spiritual victory in our lives. He does. But he doesn't always do it with aggression. You might think he would. He doesn't. Sometimes he's a whole lot more subtle than that. And I'd say his most dangerous strategy is his so-called alignment with truth. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14? He says, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He's not an angel of light, but he disguises himself as an angel of light. So church, we need to be on our guard every day. Because we don't want the devil to get a foothold in our lives or in the church. We need to be on guard. Verse 18. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit. Notice he didn't really say it to her. He said it to the Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. That sounds like a great thing Paul just did, right? I mean, it sounds like the whole city of Philippi would have been happy about that. Well, we'd be wrong because look at verse 19. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone... It's always about the money. It's always about the bottom line. It says they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Back in that day, people of Philippi were into witchcraft, sorcery, fortune telling. And this girl, because she was demon possessed, was being used to make money by telling fortunes and by prophesying. So when Paul cast this demon out of her, the old fortune telling business dried up. It disappeared. It ended. And her owners went ballistic. For sake of time, I'm going to paraphrase the story. But these men that were making profit from this girl, they became very angry, and I'll stress very angry. They complained to the local authorities, and they had Paul and Silas arrested and beaten with rods and thrown in the inner cell of the prison. They threw them in the deepest, darkest part of the dungeon, sort of like a dark hole in the ground where they fastened their feet in stocks. So Things, again, aren't going real well for Paul and Silas. And again, they're doing God's work. At this point, if I were Paul, and you'd probably think the same way, I would have been like, God, what is the deal? You brought us here by using a vision. We obeyed everything you said. And now, God, look what you made happen. Look what, how things have turned out. Boy, this Christianity thing, God's really going great. I love it. No, not so much. But that's not how they responded at all. It tells us that while they were there during the dark, Part of the night at midnight in the darkest part of the dungeon the inner cell Paul and Silas if you know the story 
started singing hymns to God. They started worshiping God. Verse 25 says, but at midnight. Can you say that with me? But at midnight. The darkest part of the night, Paul and Silas were praying and singing to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I don't know if these prisoners really uh, got excited about Paul and Silas singing in the jail at midnight. I don't know. You might want to try that with your spouse tonight. Wait till midnight. They're sound asleep. Sit up in bed and sing the top of your lungs. See how they... No, you shouldn't do that. But Paul and Silas were expressing joy. In a time where it looks like, why are you expressing any kind of joy? They were expressing joy, not anger, not self-pity, but joy. Let's be honest today. You and I find it hard to rejoice sometimes if the sanctuary is two degrees too hot. Or if we think the music's too loud or too soft, too fast or too slow, too contemporary or too traditional. We struggle to rejoice if someone takes the last free donut in the Soul Cafe. Amen? Let's just admit it. We could be whiners at times. At times. But think about Paul. He's here beaten for the gospel, thrown in prison. He doesn't know what his future holds, but you know the next thing, you know what the next thing is he says? Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. He didn't just say it once. He says rejoice, and again, I say rejoice. I don't know about you, but I need more of that attitude. Anybody else need more of that attitude? I think we all do. Let's go back to where it said the prisoners were listening to them. This is a good principle for us to never forget that when we're suffering as Christians, the world's watching us. They're watching us to see if we're going to practice what we preach, if we can truly have the joy of the Lord in the good times and the bad. They're wanting to see if we have enough faith in Jesus that even in our worst moments, we have something to sing about. They're watching whether you think they are or not. They're watching how you respond to your troubles, how you respond to your problems. And then while they were rejoicing and praising, it says in verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. Think about it. God sent an earthquake, and the prison foundations were shaken. The prison doors flew open. Their chains were loosed. Let me just interject something here, because I can't pass up on a point like this. Whenever you're going through your troubles, your problems, and your pain, instead of griping and complaining and getting mad at God, how about throwing up some praises to God? How about starting to sing him a little praise and thanks for the good things that are going right? Because so many times we focus on all the things that are going wrong when there are so many things right. Amen? Just try it sometimes. The jailer who woke up, he saw all these prison doors opened. Look at verse 27. It says, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He knew that the authorities were going to take his life if he let these prisoners escape. So he decides his best way out is to take his own life. But I like what Paul says in verse 28. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. We are all still here. God comes through once again. An earthquake hits, the doors flew open, shackles come off, the chains come loose. And Paul and Silas choose to stay. They chose to stay in that dark dungeon. When I read this, I wonder, why in the world did you stay? Why didn't you run away? doesn't take me long to realize, wait a minute, they didn't run away because that wasn't their mission. They weren't supposed to run away. Their mission was not about their freedom, their comfort, their happiness, or their safety. Their mission wasn't to be free. You know what their mission was? To be used. Their mission was to be used. And God used them to lead this suicidal prison guard to Jesus. They had a mission. If they would have ran, they would have missed the mission. They didn't run. They stayed. Look at verse 29. Then he, the jailer, called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Think about that. This jailer was so impressed by Paul and Silas and the love that they had shown him, And from their ability to have joy in the midst of their misery, that he instantly wanted what they had. He instantly wanted that kind of life for himself. So he asked the question, what must I do? You know, the most important question for us today in life is not how to get a better job, not how to get a raise, not how to deal with our marriages. 
not how badly the Bears or the Cubs are going to win uh, today. That's not the biggest question. The biggest question is, what must I do to be saved? And that question has a very single answer, simple answer, that has nothing to do with the doing and everything to do with the believing. Nothing to do with the doing, everything to do with the believing. Look at verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Household. That's it and that's all. Paul didn't say if you want to get saved, you have to go join a church. You have to get baptized, which we see the jailer does get baptized. But he's not answering the question, what do I need to do after I'm saved? That would be baptism. He says, what do I need to do to be saved? And they gave him a simple answer, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not you might be saved. You'll know when you get there. No, you will be saved. That word believe means to cling to. It means to trust in. It means to rely on. It's like when you sit down in a chair, you're making a decision that you're going to trust that chair is going to hold you up, right? Well, let me say this. Salvation is not a do-it-yourself project. If you want to go to heaven, the first thing you have to realize is you can't earn your way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. The jailer took them, the prisoners, to his own home. Look what it says in verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. So he's tending to their wounds. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Think about it. It began with him saying, what must I do to be saved? And then it continued to the whole family. It was a chain reaction. You know, we can have that same kind of chain reaction in our lives today. So why did God allow Paul and Silas to go to jail? God had a purpose. God had a plan. And it was so they could be in the right place at the right time to get the good news of the gospel to this jailer and his family. So even if it doesn't look good sometimes, even if it's not a good situation, God was still at work. And they actually found God's purpose, even in the pain. Someone might need to hear that this morning. Maybe you're sitting here and nobody knows it, but you're going through a tough time. You're going through a major struggle in your life. And and if you're not right now, let me guarantee you, you will be sometime. Just remind yourself. Remind yourself that that does not mean that God doesn't have a plan for your life. He does. Maybe He's using this to grow something in you. Maybe He's using this to change something in you. You know, a piece of coal turns into a diamond because of pressure, right? Right? Turn to your neighbor and say you're a piece of coal. Go ahead, do it. Now say who's becoming a diamond. It's a process. Let me close with this real quick. Why are these three stories recorded in the Bible? I think it's to show that the gospel, the word of God is for everyone. That salvation is for everyone. And think about the characters that he used. Three completely different types of people. You've got a rich religious woman, you've got a slave girl, and you've got a Philippian jailer. I think that's a pretty diverse group of believers, right? We could put it this way. We've got a merchant, a jailer, and a demon-possessed girl. Now you're sounding more like Victory Church, amen? Because we've got those with ugly backgrounds. We do, me included. And those whose lives have been pretty much on the straight and narrow their whole life. But let me say this, but all of us together... Just like the first church in Philippi are a family of God on a mission to pursue Him more and tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ to be a better church. Lydia, the demon-possessed girl, and the jailer were charter members of the first church in Philippi. What's that tell us? It doesn't matter who you are. Rich, poor, black, white, young, old, conservative, liberal, religious, not religious, from good families or broken families. We all have one problem, sin. And we all have one solution, one hope of salvation, and that's Jesus. Amen? So it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, how far you've fallen. This is His promise to us today of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Just believe in His Son. The heart of God has always been to extend salvation to all. His word says that he doesn't want one to perish, to be lost. So don't forget this as we go into this new work week, this school week, because God is still on the move. And I believe he's preparing hearts that we're going to encounter tomorrow. 
It might be someone who you don't even know their name yet, but God is preparing them, setting you up to preach His Word, to minister His love. We need to reach out to all people. All people, not just our kind of people. A lot of times we only minister to those that are like us. No, reach out to all kinds of people. It doesn't have to be people of our color or economic status because people everywhere, I mean everywhere, are lost and need the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You realize God has given us the job, the privilege, the opportunity to be called ambassadors of Christ, to work alongside Him, to go out into this world and share the good news with everyone that we meet, to tell them, everyone that will listen. I pray that we, I think we need to pray that we're filled with the Holy Spirit when those opportunities arise that we'll be ready, willing, and able to preach the gospel and then see God change the lives. He's the one that changes the hearts. He did it in the lives of these three people in our stories today. And he's done it in my life. I'm sure he's done it in many of your lives. He's done it in our lives. And today and this week, I believe we're going to see him do the same thing with the people around us that he puts in our path. And you know what our job is? Be available. Be available and let God work through you. Even in uncomfortable situations, take yourself out of the equation because it's not you yourself, it's you and God. And you and God are a majority, amen? You and God have limitless power because He's the one with limitless power. So the next time we get the opportunity to share the gospel, and I counted up before the pandemic that we had uh, represented here 21 different communities in this little church. 21 different places that we can take the gospel back to those communities where you work, where you go to school, where you live, and tell them about Jesus. That's our job. Amen? Could you stand at your feet today? If you need prayer for anything, um, whether it has anything to do with what I've preached on or not, we invite you to come up after the service. Pam and I and Carmen will be up here um, to pray with you. We'd love to pray with you, agree with you in faith. Our hearts in prayer. Father God, I pray that you would help us to dream bigger, to believe bigger in our faith today. Help us to realize that even when doors close, Lord God, you've got another one ready to open. To realize that you put uh, your Son, the Spirit of your Son, in our lives so that we could share it to the world around us with the love and the power that the Holy Spirit can bring. Father, I thank you that you've given us the good news of Jesus Christ to share the world to the world around us, that we might show them who you are. Give them a a good picture of who you are, of your love, of your truth. Father, help us to win souls to you in everything we do. And today, Lord God, if there's anyone here that's never made a commitment to ask Jesus Christ into their heart, I pray that you would tug on their heart right now. I pray that you would convict their heart right now. And I want to give this whole room an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ into their hearts, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Can we all pray this prayer? Lord, I give you my life. I admit that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me. I believe in Jesus. And I place my faith in him. I believe he came from heaven to earth. That he died on a cross. That he shed his blood for my sin. And I believe he rose from the dead. And I turn from my sin. And I turn to Jesus as my Savior. Help me to follow Him as my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Go out and tell the world about Jesus. See you next week.